Hello Calculus Kids, this is Mr. Bean, and I am excited for today's lesson because we are finally going to talk about the derivative, an incredibly crucial part of calculus. So let's start off with my own personal definition. This is just how I would describe it in words to kids who don't know what a derivative is, and that is that a derivative is just some expression, or really kind of like an equation, that calculates the instantaneous rate of change. So in other words, the slope of the tangent line of a function at any given x value. So it's going to spit out, the, the derivative spits out the slope of the function at a point. Let me show you what I mean by this. Here we have a function f of x equals x squared, just a simple parabola with a, a minimum here at the origin 0 comma 0. If this is the function, its derivative is represented by 2x. Don't worry about how I got that, we'll talk about that in just a minute. So if the derivative is 2x, what the derivative does is if we plug the number 1 in, if we plug a 1 in here, we get 2 times 1 is 2. So if I look at the slope of x squared right there at the number 1, if x equals 1, you'd have a tangent line that has a slope of 2. Notice that line right there has a slope of 2. So let's do it with the next one. If we plug a 2 into the derivative, 2 times 2 is 4. So that means if I come over here to where x equals 2, right there, the tangent line at that point would be a 4. Boom, and there you have it. You have a tangent, uh, a tangent line that has a slope of 4. And then so then the last one, just to make sure we are seeing how this works, 2 times 2, negative 4. And then you can see here, if we scroll over here to negative 2, right there, you have a tangent line that has a slope of negative 4. So that's what the derivative does. The derivative will give us the slope of the function at a specific point, or in other words, the slope of the tangent line. Slope of the tangent line. And we're going to use this a thousand times this year. It's going to go over and over again. The derivative is really like half of what this year is about. So now if we don't have a graph, let's just take a look at this real quick. If all we have is, we don't even know what f of x is. Notice here I only have f prime. Uh, and that's how you denote if you have the derivative. You put a little prime there, a little apostrophe, f prime. So if we plug in a 2 to this, you're going to have 5 over 2 minus 2. So 5 halves minus, this is like 4 halves. This is going to equal 1 half. Just do a little bit of arithmetic there, you get 1 half. So what does that mean? So that means that the slope of the tangent line of f of x at x equals 2 is one half. The slope of the tangent line is one half. We don't even have to know what f of x is. We don't know what the what f of x looks like in this example. We just know that the slope of f is one half right there at x equals two. All right. So let's. How about this one down here? If f of x represents how many meters you have run, and x represents the minutes, describe in full sentences the following. So this first one is what we've been doing all through high school, just working with function notation. So it should be simple enough that eight is the x x represents minutes, and then 1500 is the y, or the f of x, and that is the meters. So after eight minutes, I ran 1500 meters. That's the first one. Now the next one is different because it has a little prime right there, f prime of three, a little apostrophe. So if we plug in a three, three is still the x, so it's going to be three minutes, but now it's different because it's the derivative, which means the instantaneous rate of change. So what we'd say now is that at the third minute, I was running 161 meters per minute. And it's important that you recognize every time you have the derivative, you're having a rate of change. So that's why we have this per, meters per minute. So you want to be careful about how you describe this. It's not just 161 meters. It has to be a rate of change. So we've got a few different ways of using notation for the derivative. The first one is we've already done f prime of x. You have a little apostrophe right there, f prime of x. Now you don't have to remember which one's Lagrange notation and which one's Leibniz. Don't stress about memorizing that. I just organized this way so you could see. Now if you had your equation instead of f of x, if it was like y equals x squared minus 3x or something like that, then instead of f prime, you could just use boom y prime. Okay, pretty simple. And then Leibniz, the last way of doing it, would be you could write dy dx. Now literally, and you might write this in your notes, this means the derivative of y with respect to x. Let me say that one more time. This notation means the derivative of y with respect to x. Now the reason that's important because later in the year we're going to do a whole bunch of things with different variables. Maybe we're going to say 
something about the radius of a sphere over time. And so we would say the derivative of r with respect to t. So we'll have different ways of doing this. For now, you just got to worry about dy dx. This will come in handy for a lot of things we'll do this year. Okay, now it's time for the really nerdy, mathy definition of the derivative. Let me pull something up from last lesson, and that was when we worked with the average rate of change between two points. So if I have some point x, f of x, and I add a distance along the x value, so I'm just going to add h, then I end up with my new point would be x plus h. So I don't know what x is, I'm just going to add some imaginary number h, and I have a new point x plus h. Then the y value, if the original y value was f of x, the new y value will be f of x plus h. Okay, so uh, this, the thing that's nice about this is this is not just for one specific point, it's for any possible x anywhere along this graph. So as we bring the h and we get the h closer and closer to zero, we just make it smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, you can see this dashed red line gets closer to what the tangent line would look like. So let me show you the tangent line, boop, is there in green. I'm gonna bring it down here, maybe you can see a little bit better. So I have the green tangent line at x, and as this distance h, as the h gets smaller, I could drag this blue dot closer and closer and closer, you can see the red line, which is the average rate of change, becomes the tangent line. So it gets really close to the tangent line. I can't get it perfect, but you get the idea here. So you can see up here is the average, here is the instantaneous, the tangent line, and then they become closer and closer. Now I've got this down below, I've embedded it on the website, so you can play around with it yourself, just so you can see. You could enter in any equation you want and just kind of click and drag, and you can see that the average rate of change will become close to the instantaneous. So the green line, let me make sure I repeat this. The green line is not the derivative. The green line is the tangent line. The slope of the tangent line is the derivative at that point. Okay, so what we're going to do, let me go back now to this. What we're going to do is take f of x plus h minus f of x. We take, subtract the y values, and then notice the denominator. Now that looks a little bit weird, but that's because it used to be x plus h was the first one, and then subtract x, right? So if x plus h minus x is the, denom is the denominator. Well, the x is canceled. That x minus that x cancels, and all you have is y left over. So this f prime equals this whole thing. That will give us an equation for the derivative. All right, let's use it. Here we go. So find the derivative using the definition of the derivative. So f prime of x is going to equal, uh, this is going to be the limit as h approaches zero of, okay, this is going to be kind of long, so you're going to need to write small. Ooh. In fact, I probably have already screwed you up by starting where I did. You're going to be irritated with me. I'm moving this over because I don't have enough room. And then uh, I'm going to plug in two. Now I have to plug in an x plus h everywhere I see an x, so minus seven, and then again an x plus h plus one. So what I've written here is just f of x plus h. I, here's my f of x, and I plugged in an x plus h. Now I subtract, and I'm gonna put a bracket, an open bracket, and then I subtract f of x. Remember from my formula here, we have x, f of x plus h, and then subtract f of x. So then I will subtract f of x, which is 2x squared minus 7x plus one, and then that is all over h. Okay, so now we have it set up where we've practiced in unit one how to take the limits of things like this. So that's all you gotta do now, is just simplify this all out. So I'm gonna fast forward as I work through this now. Okay, so now we have, if you look at each of these terms in the numerator, every one of those terms that are, is left has an h. So I could factor out an h, set up my fraction, an h times what's left. This will be a 4x plus 2h minus 7, and then on the bottom I still have h. And the reason this is now nice is because that h and that h can cancel. And I can just work with the limit as h approaches 0 of this thing, and I now have my answer, that f prime of x 
is going to equal, plug in a zero to this h, it cancels out, and I just have 4x minus 7. This is the derivative of the original equation up here, 2x squared minus 7x plus 1. This gives us the slope of any point we wanted. So if I now plugged in f prime of 5, I could look at the graph of this, which is a parabola. 4 times 5 is 20, 20 minus 7 is 13. The slope would be 13, right at that point of x equals 5. Okay, let's do this again. Let's just practice one more time. Now here I have a y. So when I do the derivative, it would be either say y prime equals, or I could say, I'm going to do this one dy dx equals, just for the practice of that Leibniz notation. So we're going to set the same this way the same way up, limit as h approaches 0 of, let's create my big fraction, and now I do f of x plus h first. So I take this thing and I plug in an x plus h. So 1 over parentheses x plus h, close parentheses squared. And then I subtract f of x. So I don't change, do anything to it. I just subtract it. 1 over x squared. And then that's all over h. I guess my fraction didn't have to be quite so big. Okay, so now what in the world do we do? This is where we're, again, we're going to use the skills that we've been practicing throughout unit 1 to be able to simplify this limit. So I'm still saying h is approaching 0. So let's take these two things and get common denominators. So I'm going to multiply this one top and bottom by x squared. So I'll have x squared over x squared times x plus h squared minus. And I'll multiply this one top and bottom by x plus h quantity squared. So I'm going to have x squared times x plus h quantity, oops, quantity squared, all over x plus h quantity squared. And now again, this is still all over h. Holy cow, this is a lot of fractions and fractions. Okay, let's clean this up now. Limit as h approaches 0 of, so these have the same denominator, so I can put them together. So I'm going to have x squared over x plus h quantity squared. And the numerator is x squared minus this whole thing. So it's, I'm going to multiply this out. It's minus x squared plus 2hx plus h squared. And then instead of saying all over h, I'm going to say times 1 over h. It'll help clean this up a little bit faster. Okay, the limit as h approaches 0. Uh, so notice here, that minus distributes, distributes, distributes. So the x squared minus x squared cancels, and I'm going to have minus 2hx minus h squared all over x squared. And you don't need to multiply out the denominators. Hardly ever will you multiply out any denominators because it just keeps things nice and neat if you can do it like this. And then times 1 over h. All right, I'm going to scroll down. Sorry, I may not have left you enough room. The limit as h approaches 0. Uh, so I can see here I can take the h out. h factors out. I'm left with negative 2x minus h all over x squared times x plus h squared times 1 over h. All right, let's cancel stuff. H is gone, H is gone, and then I can go ahead and plug in 0, so this is going to equal, H becomes a 0, so I have negative 2x over, what's here, this is x squared times x squared. Whew. So then I get things that simplify, so that my derivative is now dy dx is going to equal negative 2 over x cubed. That is the derivative of the monster problem of this original 1 over x squared. So it's negative 2 over x cubed. Now here's the good news. This was a lot. You're only going to have a few problems on the practice set today, uh, as well as the master check, where you have to use the definition of the derivative like this. There are shortcuts that make this problem actually really easy. Some of you know the shortcut already. You still have to do it the long ways because we have to connect how these limits work with the definition of the derivative. But for the whole rest of the year, you're going to use the shortcuts, okay? So don't stress about having to do this this really long, tedious way over and over again this year. It won't happen like that, okay? Later in this unit, we will learn some shortcuts. Now, the last thing we need to talk about in this lesson is how to do the equation of a tangent line. This will come up literally hundreds of times this year. We're going to use it over and over and over again, so make sure this is clear in your mind. You've been doing equations of lines since middle school. Equations of lines, and we're going to use point-slope form, okay? A lot of times uh, you guys are used to focusing in on y equals mx plus b, where you have slope and a y-intercept. But in actuality, to come up with an equation of a line, this is a little bit more challenging because you need slope and the y-intercept. A lot of times we don't have the y-intercept. So instead of y equals mx plus b, we're using point-slope form. Notice I have highlighted in red y1, m, and x1. And the reason behind that is because of what they represent. So what I want you to write down is this, but you're going to leave some blanks here because I'm going to plug stuff into this. So what is y1? If we have a function f of x, y1 is just f of a. If you plug in an a into the function, you get a y value. Okay, so whatever, whatever your x value is. And then m is your slope of the tangent line. And we've learned in this lesson that slope of the tangent line is the derivative. So you take the derivative and plug in your a. And then the x value is just a. Okay, so this is what you're doing right here. This is the equation of a tangent line. 
So when it says come up with an equation of a tangent line, that's what we're looking for. Point slope form and just plug in the things that you need. Okay, so let's, if you don't have that written down, write it down now. I'm going to move to the next slide and use this equation to come up with everything we need. So again, sometimes if I forget what I'm doing, I just write real quick, oh yeah, what's point slope form? Y minus Y1 equals the slope times X minus X1. All right, and then uh, we actually already know several of these things, right? So let's just start writing out our answer. Y minus, now what's the, what's the Y1? It tells us right here, the coordinate point is five comma negative two. So it's negative two. So Y minus negative two is just Y plus two equals, now I need the slope. I don't have the slope yet. I'm going to skip that for a minute. But I do have the x. The x is just 5, right? 5 there. So now how do we get the slope? The slope's the derivative. It's h prime of what x value are we using? 5. So we want to figure out what's h prime of 5. So we plug this into 5 cubed minus 2 all over 5. 5 cubed is 125 minus 2 over 5, and then that equals 123 over 5. This then would give us the equation of the tangent line at x equals 5. That's how we do it. Just one little step here. It doesn't say to put it in point slope form, so it, or excuse me, in the slope intercept form. So we didn't have to do y equals mx plus b. If it doesn't say specifically to do that, then don't worry about it. Stop here, much easier, and you're not going to make more mistakes. All right, one more. This will help you a little bit with some test prep problems that you're going to have today. And this is the first time you've seen anything like this, and that is this is the graph of the derivative. All that means is that if I say what's f prime of what's f prime of uh, negative two, f prime of negative two right there would equal three. All that tells us is that when x equals negative two, the slope of f is three. This is not the graph of f. It's the graph of f prime. All right, so all we have to do then is, it says here, the graph of f prime, the derivative of f is shown at the right. If f of 2 equals 7, write an equation, equation of the line that's tangent to the graph. Okay, equation of tangent line, that's all we're doing. So what is that again? y minus y1 equals the slope times x minus x1, and I fill in the things that I need to know. So it's y minus, what's the y value? 7 equals, now what's the slope? The slope is the derivative. Here's the derivative. I want to go to where x equals 2. So here's x equals 2. Right there. Right there. x equals 2 is going to be a value of 3. So that's my slope uh, for the tangent line. And then I say x minus, what's the x value? 2. And then that's it. Okay. Again, I don't have to keep going on that. I don't need to solve for y or anything. I can just stop right there. Okay, whew, that was a long lesson. That's everything we've covered. You're now set up to begin working with derivatives. So exciting. And then in a couple more lessons, we'll jump into how to do some shortcuts with it. All right, rock that mastery check. I'll see you back in the next lesson.